Hi everyone, good morning. Um, thanks for joining this webinar. The topic for today's webinar is working from anywhere with advanced load balancing and VMware Horizon VDI. Um, we'll see how this integration works, how working from anywhere uh, is more efficient and how this integration makes it easier. Uh, we have Abhinav and Mitali joining us to present this webinar. Um, it's a 60 minutes long webinar and um, we are going to be presenting and then uh, following it up with the demo as well. So thanks a lot for attending in whatever time zone you are in. Just a few housekeeping guidelines before I turn it to Mitali and Abhinav uh, to begin their presentation. Um, the first part will be the quick presentation and then they both will be showing you a live demo. Um, let's make it interactive. If you have any questions, you can either put it in the chat um, and, and I'll help along, we'll all help along answering those. Um, the session is being recorded, so you will get the recording as well as the slides in a follow-up email. And uh, if you find the content really useful, then feel free to share it with your coworkers um, for those who are not able to make it this time. We do this on a recurring basis every month. So for those who are not able to make it this time, we highly encourage them to register for the next one. Um, so yes, uh, please use the Q&A window to ask questions and uh, we'll keep it more interactive. So without further ado, um, let me introduce you to Abhinav and Mitali, um, our speakers today. Abhinav uh, and Mitali, it's all yours. Thank you, Sarbi. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I hope you can see my screen, uh, Sarbi. Yes, we can, Abhinav. Yeah. Thank you. So hello everyone and welcome to this first webinar of 2021. Hope 2021 is better than last year in various ways. Uh, my name is Abhinav. Uh, I'm a product manager with uh, Avi, now part of VMware, working with the Avi product team. Uh, with me, I also have Mitali, uh, who is also another technical product manager uh, uh, in the same team. Today, we'll be, uh, as Sarbhi mentioned, we'll be talking about uh, VMware Horizon VDI uh, and, and how Avi Networks or the NSX Advanced Load Balancer can help uh, people work from anywhere using these two technologies. Feel free to put your questions in the chat window and we'll get to that. So what we'll be covering today, as Sarbhi mentioned, was a quick introduction to uh, Avi or as it is now called the NSX Advanced Load Balancer. <clears throat> We are looking at uh, various feature sets and what differentiates us uh, as an architecture uh, from other competitors or other more legacy offerings which are present in the market. Uh, we will look at how this relates and translates into Horizon uh, VDI use cases. Uh, and finally, we will be doing a demo of Avi's capabilities, both in general as well as with VDI, uh, followed by any pending Q&A which you may have. So this is uh, just a quick summary of what uh, uh, the v VMware NSX Advanced Load Balancer can do. Uh, what we are, when we were founded, we had a vision of being an enterprise grade, best in class, layer four through layer seven application delivery controller or ADC, uh, covering use cases such as load balancing, web application firewall or WAF, and global load balancing or GSLB. So that's what we've been doing prior to acquisition in 2019. Uh, we've been delivering a lot of features in a consistent way across multiple clouds, multiple ecosystems. We're also working on container and services with the Kubernetes and OpenShift. Post acquisition in 2019, we, uh, we continue to do all these innovations for load balancing use cases uh, in a multi-cloud uh, multi form factor and environment. In addition, uh, integration with VMware and acquisition has enabled us to provide better together story for a lot of VMware products and, and uh, solutions. Uh, the chief among them, of course, are the NSX, uh, NSXT and uh, the NSXT uh, networking infrastructure. So that is, uh, you know, where we integrate to provide load balancing services in NSX environments. Uh, that also translates into VMware virtual uh, VCF and other uh, similar ecosystems. 
on the uh, on the uh, manageability side we we are integrating with vro vra with vrni um, and other such tools to provide better uh, visibility and analytics uh, and finally on the solution space we are also working very closely with uh, with the EOC or end user compute team for uses such as Horizon VDI uh, as well as UEM uh, uh, UEM deployments. Right. And finally, we are working closely to provide container ingress services to the Tanzo portfolio as well. So, along, so previously we had uh, this multi-cloud uh, integrations uh, which were non-VMware, along with of course vSphere and NSX already, and now. We have those, and in addition to that, we are working closely for a better together source story with VMware solutions. As you may be doing, all of your Horizon uh, Horizon uh, deployments do need load balancing. So you could it could either be an NSX load balancer, it could be a third-party appliance. So what Avi delivers over here as a solution is a full-stack VMware VDI plus load balancer. So you can have both the load balancer as well as the VDI from VMware, uh, so better support, better pro, better cost, and we'll see how that works uh, in, in the next few slides. So before we get into what uh, Avi is and what we do, uh, just want to uh, focus on what some of the business continuity challenges which have been uh, exposed uh, in the last year or so, thanks to the pandemic situation. So enterprises, uh, as you know, in you know March, February, March timeframe and beyond last year, were rushing to enable remote workers as you know some parts of the uh, nation uh, nations got into lockdown or restriction into getting into offices. Uh, so a few few challenges which uh, our enterprise uh, customers faced uh, were the following. First of all, uh, traditional load balancers, typically appliances, uh, take too long to deploy. And the reason for that is right from getting a provision, uh, getting it to procure, uh, to get it uh, shipped and available in your data centers, and then provisioned is a matter of weeks. Uh, it could be you know two to four weeks or more, uh, and and if there is a supply chain issue, then then longer. There is a dependency on networking teams. So these appliances, although are managing your VDI applications or want to provide services to that. Uh, still have to be managed uh, and provisioned by networking teams. So that in, uh, dependency on uh, various teams for manual work to deploy and configure load balancers slows down the provisioning further. And finally, if you're, uh, as you saw, maybe you had an enterprise uh, deployment and you wanted to use a on-premises uh, or a public cloud solution for burst capacity. It could be things like VMC on AWS. It could be Horizon Cloud on Azure. So in that case, you would want the uh, the load balancer to be consistent across these. And in some cases, that is not the case, primarily because it could either be separate products or the same product in a different form factor, having a different way to operationalize and monitor. Secondly, it is hard to troubleshoot. Uh, typically, load balancers, uh, the traditional load balancers are sold in active standby or pairs, uh, either appliances or virtual appliances. So you need to manage each of, them, uh, each of these separately. There is no automation. Uh, you could argue that we have, you know, instance managers or uh, bolted upon REST APIs, but then they're not as cloud native as you would expect from uh, a, a cloud, cloud first vendor or a cloud first system, uh, which, which Avi, for example, is. So the challenge with that is first of all provisioning, which should take days uh, or hours taking days to weeks from an end to end perspective. There's no insight to troubleshoot user experiences. So you could get some information from, on the network from a different tool. Uh, the load balancers themselves provide limited uh, information on what's happening, uh, especially at a per request basis. And then it's hard to troubleshoot remote working performance when you can't correlate IP addresses with you know GI locations or, or or classify them based on where they're coming from. And finally, if you come to the third column, uh, they they tend to be expensive and overprovisioned. Uh, the reason for these is the following: the expense comes from the fact that uh, these load balancers, as I mentioned, are active standby. So just being on standby wastes wastes 50% of the capacity 
It's just waiting for you in case the active uh, active appliance goes down, the standby has to take the load. But it doesn't. It can't uh, start using that until the active has gone down. So 50% of your resources are lying unutilized all the time. And secondly, they they tend to be over provisioned because because of a couple of reasons. One, because the form factor is rigid. You have to buy them as appliances with a specific performance. You can only scale by upgrade by buying one more box or a pair of boxes. There is no linearity or uh, step up functions available uh, or elasticity in the scale out. And so, so because of these two reasons, what you would have to do is provision for peak capacity, even if the peak capacity is just a few days or a few months in the year. Right. Let's now take a look at what happens on the public cloud side. So if you were planning to, for example, use Horizon Cloud on Azure in, or uh, deploy in VMC on AWS. Right. Uh, so the, here you have two options in general. One, you have the legacy uh, appliances uh, as a virtual appliance. For, so in that case, you get all the features which which you know a legacy appliance gives, which is quite a lot. They they do have enterprise grade features. The trade off over there is there is no automation. The cloud native capabilities which you would expect in a public cloud are not available there. The other choice you have is to go with a cloud provided LB, for example, an Azure load balancer or an application gateway. In AWS, you have uh, the ALB set of uh, you know products. So there. You have excellent uh, automation. You have excellent self-service capabilities and elasticity. But what you what you lose is features, because the features which they provide have typically not been able to catch up to an enterprise gate uh, load balancer. Could be a legacy load balancer, Ravi. Uh, secondly, more importantly, if you want multi-cloud consistency, then that's missing because these providers or the loads, these these products on the public cloud will cater only to their own public cloud. So the question comes as to can you have the best of both worlds? Can you have an enterprise class load balancer, which also provides you with elasticity, automation, and flexibility, uh, and multi-cloud uh, multi-cloud feature consistency across uh, you know all the environments you'd want? And that's where Avi comes in. How do we do that? So when we were founded, Avi was based upon the principles of uh, what is now obvious, but uh, a distribution of the control plane and the data plane. So the top row, which you see, with this is the Avi controller, is a software uh, is a software system running in your environment, or it could be a SaaS or a service as well. This controller is the brains of the system. What this does is it deploys these other virtual machines or data plane instances, which do the actual load balancing, and that's that's data plane. Data plane. So the separation of the control plane and data plane ensures that all your data uh, needs can be elastically scaled uh, by the controller as required. And the life cycle of this in terms of provisioning the, the data plane instances, which we call service engines, is not manual. So if you go to the previous slides, where I showed that provisioning is a challenge in case of Avi, you don't have to uh, figure out which virtual next you want to uh, are, are, are present and which have to be uh, stitched uh, to get access to your UAGs. All of that is done by the AVI controller automatically, and the plumbing is taken care of. All you have to do is create the virtual IP and the virtual service, and you're good to go. And we do this in an elastic manner, so you can add capacity as you would want. Let's say you know you have a big billion day scale coming, or uh, you know a Black Friday event. All you need to do is increase the number of service engines. Just have a license available. Say that I want more load balancers, and you're good to go. It can be multi-cloud, so the same controller could uh, work on-premises. It could run on public cloud. We could take over an entire bare metal server and work on that as well. So what this provides us with uh, is great analytics, which we'll see in the demo, and uh, automation as well. We are natively uh, and REST API first, so everything you see on the UI on the CLI are actually API calls. That allows us to work with uh, any tool you would want, either you know Python, Go, Java SDKs, or Ansible, Terraform, you name it, and we have that. 
Uh, and finally, a very quick uh, view on, on the fact that you could also uh, offload the management of the controller to Avi slash VMware. So we have a Avi controller SaaS offering. Uh, you could just bring your own subscription uh, in the public cloud uh, to and connect it to the SaaS system. And with that, the control plane is managed by Avi. Uh, the data plane is managed by you. With that, uh, you get proactive monitoring in case you are running out of capacity on the control plane. Uh, you, you get uh, upgrades done automatically by the uh, by the team, so you don't have to look at upgrades and a bunch of other features. So switching gears to uh, Horizon uh, and, and what we do. And before that, uh, let me just tell you that we will be doing a demo of these capabilities where you could see all of what I talked, all the goodness, uh, which Mithali will be doing after these slides are over. So in case of Horizon, uh, Avi provides a full stack feature set uh, pr to provide load balancing services. Uh, in this view, I have shown two sites, one, the first one being on-premises on top, and the second one public cloud. So this could be, you know, Azure or it could be VMC on AWS. Uh, so we we do uh, the load balancing for the UAGs, for the connection servers, for the app, app volumes uh, as required. We also do GSLB. So you, if you have multiple sites, you can use Avi as a global load balancer or a DNS-based load balancer to have various either active, active, active standby, weighted uh, load to the, to the various sites as you would like. We'll go into the architectures in more detail in the next few slides. So with that, I just wanted to, uh, you know, to summarize uh, how and what we do uh, in in in, con in conjunction uh, in context of Horizon. We we build you a complete VMware VDI solution. So you have one click deployment. So the controller is deployed automatic. Uh, you know, once it is deployed, you don't have to go to multiple teams to actually deploy the load balancer. Just create a virtual service and you're good to go. You can do it in any cloud, and it's the fact the load balancing provisioning is a matter of hours or minutes, uh, not not days. Secondly, it's easy to troubleshoot, and we'll see that in in our in the demo. And finally, we have reduced costs. So because of the fact that we are active active, so we're not active standby, although we can run on that. We also support active active use cases, so you could scale up better and utilize uh, the services better. Uh, we also have on-demand scalability, and finally, we just introduced uh, this quarter a, per, uh, a, a CCU or concurrent user SKU for Avi. With that, you could tie Avi consumption uh, to the number of uh, per CCU horizon VDI uh, users you have. So with that, you don't have to worry about how many of licensing so, uh, the load balancer separately. Uh, it is just sort of an odd add-on to the number of VDI solutions you want. And that includes GSLB, WAF, all the features. Right. So as I was mentioning, all you need to know is the number of users. So if you have 1,000 per CCO users, uh, licenses, you can just get 1,000 of AVI add-on licenses for, for Horizon. And with that, you don't have to worry about the other capacity requirements or licensing requirements. Here's a quick uh, representative uh, comparison uh, we have, uh, you know, overall uh, with, with, for example, one of the competitors. So in this, apart from the fact that, you know, from an uh, from a software cost, what we also uh, also uh, save on a three-year TCO is the fact that, you know, the analytics which you provide provide a great value to the team in terms of reduced troubleshooting time and mean time to, you know, resolution as well as centralized management ensures that your OPEX also goes down. So with that, we see anywhere between, you know, 60% to 65% of uh, savings on a three year basis, uh, you know, if you include all of those indirect costs. And even on the direct productive support costs, you save 30 to 35% easily. Uh, a few more, uh, you know, snapshots of how, uh, how we compare with uh, with legacy load balancers in the on-premises case. So uh, as you can see, I'll not go through all of them, but one thing which, you know, which of course we expect from our competitors, which have been there in the market for the past 20 years, of course, they have a great feature set, as you can see, in terms of enterprise grade load balancing. So no, you know, no, no challenges there. Uh, what we do better is, as I mentioned, 
a single point of control, uh, better visibility, automation. So all of these, given that you know we've been in the market uh, and we have a fresh approach, a more distributed approach, and a more cloud-first approach, we've been able to do this, uh, uh, and, and that's where we provide a lot of savings and a lot of benefits. And finally, uh, you know, in terms of multi-cloud con consistency, especially in cases of public cloud deployments, is also where we see ourselves uh, being able to leverage our uh, our stack um, in a much better way. Ultimately, to provide you with a better cost of ownership, because ultimately that's what matters. Uh, a similar comparison with, uh, you know, for Horizon Cloud on Azure, which we also support. Uh, again, over here, uh, uh, and this is uh, this is with the legacy LB. So whatever I said earlier translates over here. Uh, more interestingly, this is uh, the next one for how we do compared to Azure LB, which is the Azure you know layer for uh, product which which is used. So in this case, of course, Azure being Azure LB being part of the stack is completely automated, completely self-service and performant. So all of that is great. Uh, what we miss is because it's layer four only, features like web application firewall are missing, and layer seven policies are missing. So it's it doesn't yet have the enterprise grade feature set which you know Avi could provide. So finally, before I hand it over to um, to Mithali, just wanted to have a uh, case study. Uh, this is an internal case study with VMware IT. Uh, we had a couple of acquisitions uh, into VMware, you know, right after Avi was acquired last year uh, or last year, last year uh, in July 2019. So the challenge over there was there were big companies and they wanted to uh, onboard and be able to access the VMware, you know, integrate with VMware uh, quickly. And given that there are multiple public companies or large companies uh, uh, in the mix, there was a challenge to stitch the networks together. So in the interim, Avi was able to provide a VDI deployment in a, in a day uh, instead of the weeks, which a legacy load balancer would have required both on both VMware sites as well as the other company sites. So with that, they were able to just get up and running across thousands of users accessing the VMware uh, network in a, in a much, much faster and much more secure way. Uh, so with that, uh, I would uh, I will hand over uh, the presentation to Mithali for uh, taking it forward. Uh, with Thanks, Abhinav. Yeah, let's let's ask. Uh, let's take a pause and ask uh, if there are any questions. You can you can put them in your um, the Q and A chat window, um, and we can help answer those questions right away. Sure. So I see uh, one question over here, which is, uh, what does uh, how does Avi get licensed? So so Avi is licensed uh, typically outside of Horizon on the data plane itself. So. Uh, on the service cores or the vCPUs of the service engines. So with that, the control plane is free. Is this is the data plane which you're paying uh, paying for? We come in one year, three year, five uh, and uh, sorry, one year, three year and perpetual SKUs. And and as I was mentioning, for Horizon we have the per CCU SKU as well. Uh, another question I see is around performance. So the question is, uh, what about performance given that you're a software solution? So that's a great question and it's been, you know, it, it's, it comes up quite a lot. Uh, given, the, given the innovations and the work which the X86 teams like Intel has done, for example, with AES and I, uh, we, we have seen the industry go away from custom A6 uh, to uh, to you know, using X86 for SSL workloads. Uh, you know, all the big companies have software load balancers. Avi is no different; it's a software-based load balancer, and we get great performance uh, on software itself. Along with that, our you know Elastic architecture ensures that you could add capacity to scale up or scale out as required. So those are the two questions. Uh, uh, Mithali, if you want to go ahead, I'll just make you the presenter. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Thanks, Abhinav. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can. 
Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. So, uh, so far we have learned the basics of RV, RV architecture and how RV is different. Now we are going to discuss how RV can be used to load balance the horizon components, and then I'll walk you through the demo. So let's start with the horizon on-prem setup. Okay, so uh, this is the sample topology of a typical uh, horizon environment where I have my UAG servers here, uh, UAG servers, connection servers, my desktops, and then I have some internal clients and the external clients. In this deployment, uh, Avi can sit in front of UAG servers to load balance the traffic which is going to UAG, or Avi can sit in front of connection servers. So this is not the exhaustive diagram. Uh, we definitely miss some components like app volume manager, etc. So Avi can sit in front of those components as well. But this is just to show that Avi can be used to load balance this traffic. When it comes to UAG, we have different design options that we support to load balance the traffic to UAG server. So in the upcoming slides, we are going to see those design options. So this is the quick summary. I'll come to it later. Let's get to this. So this is the first design option, which is called as single web with two virtual services. In this option, in this design option, we have one RV load balancer here. We have one RV VS, which is L7. And then we have another VS, which is L4 VS. So total, there are two virtual services, as the name states. One is layer 7 virtual service, and one is layer 4 virtual service. And both the virtual services are sharing the same IP. So there is single WIP, single IP with both the servers. So what happens in this case, client sends a request. And as you know, the horizon flow, the initial request, which is the authentication request, is the primary protocol. That is the XML API request. So that request lands on the L7 VS, L7 virtual service. Then Avi load balancer sends it to one of the UAG servers. In this example, Avi has sent it to UAG1. Then once authentication is done, and now I can see my app catalog and I have to launch the application. So in that case, uh, at that time, secondary traffic comes into picture, right? So that blast or PC over, PC over IP traffic. So that traffic comes on L4VS. Then Avi L4VS will make sure that we are sending the traffic to the same UAG server where the L7 traffic went so that we don't break the flow. So Avi makes sure that all the flows, primary and secondary traffic flow goes to the same UAG server and then the traffic continues. Uh, so we have two virtual services, L7 L and L4. L7 takes care of your XML traffic and L4 takes care of Blast and PC over IP. In this case, uh, the traffic terminates on RV and then we encrypt it again to send it to UAG. The biggest advantage of using this approach is you have to use one public IP and you get rich analytics and metrics for the primary protocol, which is the XML API. And I'm going to show you the logs and analytics during the demo. So this is our first design option. The second design option is single layer four virtual service. So in contrast to the first where we had two virtual services, L7 and L4, in this case, we have single virtual service, which is a layer four virtual service. So the primary traffic will come here, we'll send it to the UAG, and then secondary protocol traffic will come, blast our PC over IP, and we'll send it to the same UAG. Uh, why do we have this design option? Because there could be some use cases where NIST or HIPAA compliance is mandatory or smart card authentication is enabled on UAG. So in those use cases, uh, we recommend using L4 virtual service. We recommend this design. So based on some of the use cases or requirements, we recommend the designs. So this is for NIST, HIPAA compliance or smart card authentication. Then third design option we have is N plus one WIP. In this case, Avi is used to load balance 
the primary protocol traffic, which is XML API traffic. So we have just one VS here, which is L7 VS, and Avi will load balance the XML traffic to one of the UAG servers. The subsequent requests for the BLAST and PC over IP or your application, the secondary request will bypass load balancer and it will go to your, sorry, it will go to your UAGs directly. So only the authentication XML traffic will go through the load balancer, RV load balancer. The BLAST or PC over IP traffic will go through the UAGs directly. Uh, why would you need such a design? This is uh, useful in the case where source IP affinity is not preferable. If you have a lot of users who are coming behind the NAT and you don't need source IP persistence, in that cases, we recommend this design option because you can choose any other persistence uh, option with this design. Uh, the downside of this is uh, because you would need many public IPs. So here N represents number of UAG servers and one is for RV VIP. So if you have two UAGs, you would need total three public IPs, three VIPs. But in case of large deployments where you have say uh, like seven UAGs, so you need eight public IPs. Okay. This was for the on-prem, uh, but as Abhinav mentioned, we do support uh, deployments in Horizon Cl Cloud on Azure. So this is the Horizon Cloud on Azure uh, default deployment without RV in picture. Here you have Azure LB, and then there are uh, your pod managers are there, your desktops and everything is there. This is the default setup without RV in picture. And if RV comes into picture, then this is how it looks. So uh, for the use cases that Abhinav mentioned or for the advantages that Abhinav mentioned of RV over Azure LB, you can use RV. Or if you want security features, if you want WAF or if you want a GSLB. So for all those advanced features, you can choose RV load balancer instead of using the Azure load balancer that comes in default. So in, in present release, Avi is deployed and managed by the customer. It's not managed by VMware. So uh, everything is pretty much same as that of on-prem. You have to deploy the Avi controller and other design options would be similar to what we have discussed. So you have Avi load balancer here, which will load balance the traffic to UAGs and Avi controller is there, which is managing all these uh, service engines. For internal clients, we, we have a different uh, load balancer, which is load balancing traffic to internal UAGs. So these are my external UAGs for external traffic, and this is these are the internal UAGs for internal traffic. So we can load balance both kind of traffic. Okay, so I think we have talked enough. Uh, now we should see some of these things in action. So I'm going to show you the demo. In my demo setup, I have my controller on-prem and there are multiple workloads. Some of the workloads are on-prem while other workloads are on AWS Azure. So now we are going to see the demo. Okay, so this is my AVI controller. When I log into the AVI controller, this is the first screen. This is the default screen that I get. And this is my dashboard where we show you the applications. So these boxes that you see here, these are nothing but the applications. These are representing my application. And as you can see, these applications are of different colors, right? Some, is, some are yellow, some are orange and green. And then there is a number associated to these. So these numbers are nothing but the health scores. We'll come to the health scores after some time. Before that, let's let's talk about the basics. We'll come back to this in some time. So this is my AVI controller. This is where you configure everything and AVI controller manages the stuff for you. So basically it's an OVA file. You can download the OVA file from AVI portal and install this in your vCenter. Once it is installed, it is up and running. The very first thing that you need to do is you have to go to infrastructure and you have to create clouds. So what is cloud? So in AVI terminology, cloud is an ecosystem 
where your applications are deployed or an ecosystem to which you want AVI controller to talk to. So in my controller, I have all these ecosystems, AWS, Azure, VMware. So all these clouds are there, which means that same controller is talking to all of these ecosystems at the same time. There are connectors built in, there are APIs which are talking to these ecosystems uh, separately, but at the same time from the same controller. So if we have to see what goes in the cloud configuration, let's see that. Let me switch the tenant to admin. So this is my vCenter cloud, VMware cloud. Let me zoom out a bit. So this is what cloud configuration uh, has. So basically my vCenter address, it could be FQDN or IP address. And then I have the username password uh, for my vCenter. So as soon as I put the username and password here, uh, my controller will try to communicate to this vCenter. It will try to this vCenter using this using these credentials. If the authentication is successful, then it will allow us to proceed to the next step. If authentication is not successful, then uh, it will pop up the arrow. So these are my vCenter credentials. Once the authentication is successful, uh, AVI controller will do a discovery. As part of that discovery, it will see what all data centers are there in your vCenter, what are the management networks, what are the different VLANs and all that. So it is intelligent enough to find out all this information for you so that you don't have to do this stuff manually. So in my case, in my vCenter, I had only one data center. So that's what I have here. Then once data center is chosen, then it will ask us to choose a management network out of all the networks that it has detected. So in my lab, I have all these networks and I have chosen my management network here. Once I do this, my cloud configuration is complete. It will take two to three minutes for this cloud configuration to come up. Initially, it will be yellow and then it will turn to green, which means that my AVI controller can now talk to this ecosystem. And if it can talk to this ecosystem, now, which means that you, you can now start deploying your applications in this particular ecosystem. Uh, the other thing is, as part of this discovery that we have discussed, it finds out the networks and the routes. So in my case, for the vCenter cloud, it has auto-discovered these things as part of the cloud creation. So it knows like what all networks are there and everything. Okay. Similarly for Azure, AWS, it asks us the VPC details, the resource groups and all that. Once we fill that, uh, then it is able to talk to that particular uh, particular VPC and everything. So now my cloud is ready. My controller can talk to my ecosystem. I'll go to the next step, which is deploying my applications. So let's do that. Create virtual service. I'll start with the basic setup. So the very first question that it asks me, in which cloud do I want to create this application? Which means in which ecosystem? Let's do it in VMware. Let's call it demo app horizon. Here I have the option of uh, assigning the IP address manually or if my controller is integrated, is talking to my IPAM or DNS, uh, sorry, IPAM servers here, then I need not to do that. I don't have to bother which is the free IP. I don't have to maintain the Excel sheets and all. If my, I can just uh, integrate my controller to my IPAM provider, or I can use RV IPAM itself, and then I can just click on auto allocate. We can select the network the subnet and it will auto assign the IP address. We don't need to bother whether there is a free IP or not. It has automatically taken care of that. Then we have this application domain name, which is a DNS name. So if it is there, it will automatically register this name with my DNS provider if the DNS is integrated. For now, I don't need it, so I'll remove it. Then I wanted HTTPS 443. There are some default certs and then there are some custom certs that I have installed. If I want to create a new one, I can click create. 
for now i'll i'll go with the default sort then the next thing is select server either you can put the server ip manually or you can also select servers by network whatever is required so you can do that for now i have put this man ip manually add server save so as soon as i clicked on save you can see that this has uh, this is green and it's already up so what it does in the background it will check if there is a service engine so as abhin have explained you service engine is the data plane that is the actual load balancer that is the entity that actually processes the traffic so it will check if the service engine is already available and if it is already available whether it has the capacity to take care of this new application if it has then it will deploy the application on that service engine so in my case the service engine was already there it was healthy it had capacity so it uh, placed my virtual service on the service engine if the service engine would not have existed then it would have taken like 2 to 3 minutes to deploy a service engine service engine is nothing but a vm that it will deploy in your v center and uh, once that service engine is up then that service engine talks to the controller and then my service then my application will come up okay uh you must be wondering that i just added the server ip i did not choose the load balancing algorithm and all the all those things so because i was using the basic setup so some of the things were template uh, were using the templates but if you want to change anything we can go to the pool pool is nothing but the representation of your backend servers and under pool settings we have this uh, load balancing algorithm the default is least connections but you can choose others like consistent hash or round robin least load whatever you want you can choose from here similarly if you want persistence then you can choose from here client ip cookie tls or any custom header persistence so you can choose the persistence from here and uh, if you want to create some other monitor then you can just add active monitor there are various monitors already available and uh, we have the option to create the custom monitors as well so you can do that as well and if your server is listening on ssl then you can just check this box and choose the ssl profile so that we can talk to your backend server over ssl then these are my server ip address and these are some advanced we can these are some timeout settings we can leave these to default unless it's really required so these these are my server settings we call it pool and within the virtual service setting there are few other things like application profile application profile defines what kind of traffic it will receive so here i have secure http because it's on ssl so if i if it's plain http i can choose system http if it is layer 4 i can choose system layer 4 if it is dns i can choose system dns so based on the traffic i can choose my application profile let's quickly see what's there in the application profile it has these options like connection multiplexing x forwarded for or say this security settings like http to https redirect you don't have to create some responder policies or a duplicate a uh, wip or a dummy wip to redirect from http to https uh, you you just need to check this box and we'll take care of it we'll do the http to https redirection similarly hsts and all other options are available these are like if you want to enable compression caching uh, so all these acceleration features are also available if required then we have some of the ddos basic ddos settings on the vs level that you can choose all these are part of my application profile similarly we have tcp profile so if you want to customize anything on tcp level you can do that we have waf also and waf is super simple here you don't have to uh, build some complex policies you just have to bind a policy to the virtual service there are some inbuilt policies already but if you want to create new you can uh, do that and then your waf will be enabled as well then uh, you might be wondering if they have some you know routing policies like if this condition matches then do that so for that we do have these policy set here the first one is network security so if you want 
to match something on the for the client IP port, and then allow or deny based on that or rate limit for that matter. You can choose that. We also support IP reputation. So uh, if you want to block something using the IP reputation database, you can do that as well. The IP reputation needs AVPAL service. Just a disclaimer. Then we have other HTTP security policies where we can take action based on the HTTP parameters. So it can be path, query, host header, cookie, whatever. Let's say path. So here we can put contains regular expression, begins with, and then the match here. And in the action, we can see uh, say what we want to do, like allow rate limit, send response, or even the ICAP. If uh, we we can uh, talk to the ICAP servers if that functionality is configured, and we can check if there are any um, antivirus scannings or any content sanitization is needed. Similarly, we have HTTP request policies, response, and if uh, all these policies cannot meet your needs. We have something called as data scripts, which are custom policies. Uh, it's something similar to uh, F5I rules. So we, we do have uh, the option to create the custom rules. Then we have some access policies for authentication, like SAML. We have JWT validation and all those things available. Analytics and some advanced settings. So this is my basic VS configuration. And before going into the uh, horizon configuration, let me quickly show you our logs and analytics. So we have talked enough about it. So this is my uh, one of my virtual services, which has the traffic generator on. So traffic is being generated. And if I come to analytics, this is the graph that I get. And if we see here, this is showing me the end-to-end -end timing, like how much is the client RTT, how much time did server take to respond, server RTT, uh, app response time, and wire time for the data to be transferred. So we show all the information here because at the end of the day, how much time it took for the client to complete the transaction or access your website matters. So we show that timing to you here you can select the time, whether you want six hours, week, month, or whatever. You can choose the time here. Now, if we see this graph, right? This graph has color coding, and this is like server RTT app response. Looking at this graph, it is very much clear that there was a peak here. Now, whenever there is a you know slowness or any issue, the very first thing that we think that it might be a network issue, but that's not always the case, right? So now if we look at this peak, it's very much clear that the problem is with the app response and the data transfers time. Because if you see the green and the blue line, it is fine. There is no peak in green and blue here. The peak is only with this uh, yellow orange shade here and this one. So which means there is something wrong with the app response and data transfer, which means there is something to do with the server. There's something going wrong on the server. It's not something on the client side or the network side. So RV gives you that first point of troubleshooting. It can help you to narrow down the issue, like where does the issue lie, which side of the, uh, you know, which side of the deployment. So now we know that it is something to do with the app. Now let's see what is with the app. So we'll go to the logs here. Okay. So we we record all these transactions. We show the logs by default. We show the significant logs. Uh, by significant, we mean if there is any error of if there is or if there is something which is not as per the trend. For example, if your application generally takes say 10 milliseconds, but now if it is taking 50 milliseconds, then we'll uh, put that log in the significant log so that we can let you know that something is going wrong. So let's see what's going on here. I have these logs. Let, let me expand one of these. Okay. So this is my log here. Looking at this, this is my client RTT, server RTT, app response time, data transfer time. So looking at this, I can see that this client is coming from India, Mac OS, Chrome, uh, TLS version, everything is right here. 
then it the request went to this particular web server this was the uh, uri http 1.1 request and if header logging is enabled i have all the logs here as well so i have all the details right there in front of me now if i have to see uh, which all like what's the traffic which had high response time so i can just put that click on that message and it automatically set that as a filter google like filter so for all these messages sorry for all these resources uris the response time was high now let's see if it was with all the servers or if there was a problem with one particular server so this uh, here on the right side i get the aggregated view like uh, for example like aggregated browsers which all browsers were trying to access so this is my aggregated view so let's come back to the server ip address so let's see that so looking at this it's clear that most of the requests which i mean went to this 202 server and they had high response time so now we know that there was a problem on server side and by digging it deeper by digging further we have come to the conclusion that this was there was something wrong on this particular server right so now you can go to your server team and tell them that this particular server is taking long to respond because maximum requests are coming to that server so can you please look into it and let me know what's going wrong there right so that's just one example uh, there could be other examples where there is a where there is some error like in this case right there is 404 you want to see uh, who has sent that 404 so looking at it it's quite clear that the server has sent 404 it's not from load balancer or um, not from anywhere else it's from server so we if you want you can also set these filters from here like if you want to filter on this just click on this or if you want to filter on response code so all those things could be done and using all these things you can uh, find out what is going wrong with the application or with the server okay uh, in the interest of time i'll quickly uh, move to the horizon configuration and show you uh, like we talked about l7 and l4 vss with horizon deployment so how does that look like this is my horizon deployment and i have this is my um, l7 virtual service here this is my ip address it's running on 443 this is my um, application profile we have a inbuilt profile for vdi so you don't have to do anything just choose that profile everything will be taken care of this is my uh, pool pool in pool i have my uag servers so these are my uag servers and for uag we recommend this load balancing algorithm everything is there in our kbs which are um, available on site so these are my this is my configuration for l7 this l7 will take care of my primary traffic which is xml api then i have l4 layer 4 virtual service which is basically a tcp virtual service and i can enable all the ports on a single virtual service i don't have to create six virtual services because i want to enable six service ports i can do that all the service ports here and for one service port i can have both tcp and udp so this tcp udp everything could be here and similarly i have my pool for this and this is pretty much it for the um horizon configuration i have my demo server running here so the setup that i showed you let's try to connect to that setup um, password one second sorry about that okay Let's put the password here. Okay. Okay. I have my application desktop. Let's just try launching this. And Notepad is launched. Very quickly. Let's go to the logs here. Okay. 
I have all the logs. Significant, non significant, and I can see from where the request is coming, which location and everything and with to which server it went. If there is any error, it will show that here. Yeah, so uh, this is pretty much it uh, for the demo. This is what we had for today. Now, if there are any questions related to demo or anything else, we can take those questions. Thanks, Mitali. There was a question on uh, by Puni on how does AV network differ from AVatrix? I answered in the Q&A window. I hope that answers your question, Puni. On the certification programs, uh, yes, uh, again, it was answered, but we are working on the certification program um, and, and the date is not decided yet. All right, I think, uh, yeah, go ahead, Abina. Oh, no, I just want to close it. Uh, please go ahead, uh, Sarbi. Yeah, so then I don't think there are any more questions. Um, please feel free to reach out um, to us offline should you have any. So that was great amount of information. Um, thanks, Abina, and thanks, Mitali, and thanks everyone else for attending. Have a great day. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone.